I chose kind of Beyond the Model as a title rather than um, anything a little bit more technical because I wanted to kind of focus more on the application of oil spill modeling rather than the oil spill models themselves. So there's a hell of a lot of um, really good work going on at the moment in terms of the API and that kind of thing um, in terms of developing the models technically. What this is going to focus on is more how well, uh, me in particular, me and my team in particular are using the oil spill models and the kind of themes that we're seeing when we're engaging with the oil and gas industry and the environmental consultancies and all of that. So the focus is very much on the application of oil spill models rather than the oil spill models themselves. So I've split it into in now two because I've combined the first two bullet points into one. But it's a very high level. It's um, discussing why are we modeling the kind of applications of oil spill modeling. Um, the different uses, the crossovers, so where one application can feed into another application, so where there's opportunity for kind of streamlining of oil spill modeling projects. And then the second one, which hopefully you'll, um, you'll be able to follow, it's quite a technical um, conversation, but I've done a lot of work on my PowerPoint, so hopefully you'll be impressed by that. And hopefully I'll explain why I've got a why I've got yet another problem with some of the way probability maps are presented and things like that. And it's more to do with the interpretation of probability maps rather than the actual technical how a probability map is created. So moving on to the first thing, why are we modeling? And I wanted to kind of ping this out again through the chat. You guys can ping back. Um, why do you simulate an oil spill? What are the kind of different applications? Why do you, why do you need to oil spill model? Why do you wake up in the morning and decide that you want to run an oil spill model today? Things like, is it a regulator? Is it an operator requirement? Is it for environment reasons? So can we have a few kind of comments in the chat for, for you guys? Why do you simulate an oil spill? It can be very um, short, brief, little um, explanation. So yeah, regulatory requirement. That's a really that's that's a really good one. Um, planning and preparedness. So is that for OSCPs? So we've got all sorts of things. NEBA assistance. That's interesting. Yep, yeah, that that's coming through now. We're certainly seeing a lot more of a um, lot more information, a lot more kind of interest on NEBA. And later on, I think next month there's a we're doing another webinar on um, NEBA. So there'll be a link at the end of this presentation to those webinars, how you can sign up to those at the end of this. But yeah, you've, you've kind of captured it all. A lot of contingency planning there, actually in a response, NEBA, EIAs, um, some looking at base locations or equipment stockpile locations, where's the best place to put those. A lot of kind of emphasis on the kind of planning and looking at the risk of things like that. So what I'm trying to capture there is that there's a nice range of applications for oil spill modeling. It's not just one size sit, um, fits all. You simulate an oil spill and that's it. You just hand over a modeling report and it's applicable to everything. There's a whole range of different things that you can do. So because there's a range, there's a whole load of different things you have to take into account. What I'm, for the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to look at how there's crossovers and how we can benefit from those crossovers and how you can best create an oil spill modeling project which is cost effective, quality efficient and really solves some of those problems. Um, and also look at kind of the different applications and in particular I'm going to look at the two kind of major ones that we're seeing bouncing around and that's kind of EIAs versus OSCPs. Now the key combinations there or the key differences between OSCPs and EIAs is their purpose. We're seeing quite a lot of occasions where oil spill modeling is requested for an EIA and it crosses over and is just dropped into an OSCP or vice versa. And although that's partially correct, it is also, there's a problem there because of the purpose. And because the purpose is different, because the purpose for an EIA is strictly looking at the environmental impact, the where will the turtles be impacted, what's the risk to turtles. 
um, those kind of questions as opposed to an OSCP which is very much focused on how do I best respond and how do I best tackle the oil spill. So you can see the kind of questions that you're trying to answer with modelling for an EIA is very much focused on environmental impacts and things like that, the spawning areas, what, what, what's the impact of that spill on the environmental sensitivities or the socio-economic sensitivities. In contrast, quite heavily, is an OSCP, which is very much focused on an operational point of view. Where can I use dispersant? What, how, where am I going to be able to deploy booms and skimmers? Where is it going to be too thin to do that? Where is my aircraft going to go? When is it going to cross maritime boundaries so I need to start talking to government agencies? So those kind of questions. So the purposes of EIAs and OSCPs and some of the other ones that you mentioned, regulatory requirements, try and capture some of these. All of these different purposes mean that the modelling projects themselves should be scoped slightly differently. Now it doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean at all, that it necessarily needs different modelling studies done for each and every application. What it does mean is that when you create that data, the way it's visualised is really important to match with the purpose. So that's what I'm trying to get across. And here's, here's a good kind of crossover in terms of, okay, there's a feedback loop there between OSCPs and EIAs. If dispersant is used, what's the risk of the spawning area? Now, if those two studies are done by two separate modeling teams focusing on two separate purposes, there's a potential that that's going to get lost somewhere along the, along the way, and it's not going to feed into the EIA, or it's not going to necessarily feed back into the OSCPs. So it's kind of capturing the fact that modeling covers quite a lot of different disciplines, and it's currently segmented into just one thing. So what I've got here is my first polling question, and it's kind of along the lines of what I just said. Oil spill modelling, does oil spill modelling for an EIA have to be different to that of an OSCP? Do you have to have two separate modelling projects to deliver modelling for an EIA purpose as opposed to an OSCP purpose? You should have a poll popping up at the moment and it should be started. You guys feel free to kind of click. It's a nice easy question. I can't tell who's voted yes or no, so they don't worry about me um, tracking your answers. Um, you're not going to get into, into any trouble. How are we doing on kind of returns of... Uh, we're up to about, I don't know, 30, maybe. Most people have answered already. Sorry, OSCP stands for Oil Spill Contingency Plan. So it's the plan you put in place for, um, yeah, responding to an oil spill. It's the same as an OPEP. Sorry, it's uh, an OPEP and an OSCP are the same. Okay, I'll end the poll now. Okay. So no, an oil spill. Model. So yes, yeah, so I I would agree with that. For the most part, an EIA and an OSCP, the modelling can be done the same way. The the study, the project can be initiated in the same way. There is an argument. There is a yes, and I would say that there's a yes and a no because there's certain downstream applications. But um, generally, I'd say yes. Most of an oil spill modelling project can cover both applications, as long as you're presenting it in the correct way as you move down. It's no good presenting an EIA, a modelling report for an EIA and then just showing the same thing for an OSCP, in my opinion. So. A lot of the things, because of the way a lot of organisations are structured, including ourselves, we often see the fact that modelling services are a bolt-on and not necessarily a standalone service. So a lot of our work is OSCP based, so someone asks for an OSCP and also there's oil spill modelling included there. A lot of the times we're seeing EIAs and there's modelling there and, and a lot, especially with OSCPs and EIAs, you get a crossover, so an EIA feeds into an OSCP. And there's been more times than there sh should be really, times where we've received oil spill modelling from an EIA at the end of a project where we've done oil spill modelling for an OSCP. And unsurprisingly, the two don't, uh, don't agree. It could be for a whole number of reasons. Um, it's not that one's right and one's wrong, but those are the kind of questions that you then have to try and explain to regulators and operators. So using modelling and using these kind of tools, it's really important to kind of take a step back and say, okay, so in a campaign, we know we're going to need oil spill modelling. 
we don't we know we're going to need it for an OSCP. We know we're going to need it for an EIA. We're probably going to need it for response exercises as well. We've done a few really good response exercises looking at plume models as well as just um, your normal surface impact models. NEBA, thank you Derek for mentioning NEBA, that is building so there's certainly going to be a lot more interest as the NEBA concept gets rolled out over the next few years and a lot more people are going to start looking at NEBA and how oil spill modelling feeds into NEBA decisions. Now that will feed into an OSCP but I would imagine it will have a wider remit. And then other more bespoke ideas about location of new equipment stockpiles and anything else you can think of really that will be impacted by an oil spill. So what, we're, what I'm trying to push here is a kind of rethink about how modelling is delivered. And rather than just tie it in with downstream, okay, let's do an EIA and oil spill modelling, you can pretty much start modelling off as a service right at the beginning. So as soon as your reservoir engineers have defined a blowout scenario, and I appreciate that that can take an awfully long time, but what we're talking there is once the reservoir engineers have worked out the pressures and things like that and they've given you a release rate with an associated probability, they've given you a release duration based on, I don't know, the well cap or the time to drill a relief well or something like that. At that point, you've got enough information and a, and a location, of course. At that point, you've got enough, enough of information to simulate a stochastic model. For the, which is a probability model. So it's the big modeling results that you need. If you can get that done right at the beginning, it creates a, effectively a reference data set that you can then feed into your OSCPs, your EIAs, and anything else further downstream, which will take you away from this danger of doing separate modeling projects for EIAs and OSCPs. So that's where you'll know where you said you know you don't need to do separate modeling reports that's where I agree with you at that point you can do just one stochastic and feed that downstream into EIAs and OSCPs where potentially you might want to do oil spill modeling um, for for a particular case like an EIA is when you start identifying worst cases now worst cases is a whole separate subject which I'm gonna I'm sure I'm gonna be doing a webinar about at some point in the future but once you start thinking again, putting the context back into the project in terms of I'm looking at environmental impact, okay, what's the what's the scenario that impacts my turtle area, my turtle, I'm going to call it a turtle zone. Once I've um, identified that, then I can start doing some very bespoke modeling to identify that risk if it warrants that kind of level of impact. But certainly for a majority of the case, you're able to take a step back on modeling and go, okay, we'll just create our reference data set and then we can pass that downstream. So the whole point here is just to kind of emphasize if we move the modeling outside of that side of things and start having it as a reference data set, we're going to be able to um, develop that further and be able to make a lot more cost effective decisions really. It'll, it'll speed up the modeling project, it'll cost less, it'll create consistency through EIAs and OSCPs. So that's the kind of service level idea of things. So at this point, is there any questions? Has anything come through? Is, is there anyone kind of baffled by what I'm talking about? I'm about to move on to the fun stuff. So I, I just want to kind of get across that kind of taking modeling a step back and go, when do we start modeling? When do we deliver the service? So I think we've just got a comment from Matthew, and Matthew sort of agrees with what you said in that um, you don't need two separate modelling projects, but you would need different reviews and interpretation of the data. Yeah, absolutely. So, so th that's where the kind that's where the kind of crossover between the OSCP writer or the a EIA writer meets the modeller. So the modelling project itself can be the same but who kind of rolls that out and how that's interpreted, which is a separate question. It's not necessarily the modelers. In fact, it shouldn't be the modelers that interpret that too much for the application. It should be the specialists downstream. So it's part of a team. There's also a good question asking um, if there's going to be cases where the OSCP and the EIA may interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Are there cases? Are, are there cases, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, EIAs feed into oil spill contingency plans quite a lot. Um, they look at risk, especially it's important for an oil spill contingency plan to be aware of... Um, <laughs> I just saw that question that popped up. Um, 
there's certainly cases where um, the EIA will feed into identifying the best response strategy because it will be it will define um, what what areas are most at risk and what I'm going to talk about risk in more detail. Um, I just saw the question about worst case scenario. Um, I can spend a good half hour talking about worst case scenarios. Um, in terms, so there's a blowout worst case scenario right on the left of the visual that you've got at the moment, which is looking at the release rates. I don't think that's what you mean. I think what you mean is things like, um, from a probability map, what is the minimum time for oil to reach this shoreline? That could be a worst case scenario. Or what's in what's what's the long largest length of shoreline that could be affected in any one simulation? So worst case scenario is very much one person's worst case scenario is another person's kind of easy case. So it's very dependent, and that's why I said it's, it's a separate conversation. Really, it, it, I've, we've done a lot of work recently looking at worst case scenarios going a lot further and looking at seasonality of worst case scenarios, looking at particular sensitivities, all of that kind of information. So it's not an easy question to answer, as you can tell, because I'm rumbling on still, but it is, um, it is a good one. And it is one that I hear a lot whenever I'm out talking to people. So I'm going to move on unless there's anything that's cropped up. Fantastic. OK, now for the fun stuff. Probability maps. What is wrong with probability maps? So there's a number of things that people have come to me with about probability maps. A lot of it is about the fact that in a probability map, you're summarizing probably gigabytes of data into a single image. And you're applying that and making decisions based on all of that data. Um, and so a lot of the things in here, there's some there that are specific to Oscar for those that will use it, but other things are kind of thresholds is a big one. You have to be really careful about thresholds. We, we reveal quite a lot of reports where thresholds aren't mentioned and it plays a massive impact. So what I mean by that is, for example, for an EIA, I might be interested in the oil thickness above 0.04 microns because that's when it starts to become a little bit toxic to birds. So, that, so the probability map will be the probability of oil exceeding 0.04 microns. That's quite a mouthful. 0.04 microns in this area. When you switch it over to an OSCP, then maybe you don't want to look at 0.04 microns. I know you do in the UK, but further afield for a response base, uh, for a response purpose, really for to do anything with the oil, it needs to be 0.1 millimeters. So there's a different probability map that will be regenerated from that. So that's what I mean by oil spill, oil thresholds. And the probability in the top left-hand corner there, that's a problem. Colour, you, you would be surprised, or maybe not, about how many conversations we've had about the colour scheme that we use on our maps. Reds and blacks are a big no-no for many, just because of the public perception. And it's a valid reason to do it, because these, these documents do get, them, do get published, and having a big splat in the middle of, um, I don't know, the middle of the Mediterranean can often cause a little bit of an upset. So there's lots of things there that we, we know there's challenges with probability maps from a technical standpoint, from a, trend, uh, from a communication standpoint. I'm not going to talk about any of those. I'm going to talk about something that I'm hoping um, most of you aren't aware of, otherwise my presentation is going to slip a little bit. So what I'm going to talk about is why probability maps lead to incorrect conclusions. Thank you, Rosie. Incorrect conclusions. Um, about risk for hopefully 90% of you and I'm going to poll this so we'll know. So this is what I've spent about two days creating in PowerPoint. It doesn't look very impressive but hopefully you'll realize the amount of effort that it's gone to create the following slides. But what you see before you is a very coarse probability map. So first of all I've broken the cardinal rule and I'm using red. Um, I've also used a little explosion in the background, which I can tell you never makes it into an oil spill contingency plan. But what you've got there is a probability map. And um, 
what it's showing is the probability of an oil spill impacting a particular square. So we can see this is a square here. So because the oil spill's been released here, there's a greater than 80%, probably 100% um, probability that that will be impacted. And then next to it, there's less than 80%, and you can see how that extends. Now, that's your probability map. What I'm going to do is add some extra layers on top of that for the poll questions. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is based on what you see before you, the probability map, I want you to tell me what the probability is of this country's waters being impacted. So up here, what is the probability that a spill released from this location will impact country B's waters? And that poll should be up now. Yeah, it is. Fantastic. So you can see all the, the scale down the side matches the um, options. So over 90% saying 20 to oh. less than 30%. Okay. Right, fantastic. There's three of these, so I'm going to test you again. So we've got a key yachting area here. I'm a yachting myself, so this is quite important to me. Down in the south, and again, this the next question comes up. Can you write that down? And yeah, so that's the key yachting area. You're getting results from that. Yeah, slowly. Sorry, guys. Only one more, and then I'll um, explain why you're all wrong. Most people are saying less than 20% blue. Okay, fantastic. And the final one is uh, is the key environmental sensitivity over here. Yeah, that's open. Okay, fantastic. So it's um, it's a, it's a difficult one to explain. So so the following slides are going to kind of. For a while, for a few minutes, you're going to wonder why I'm explaining it so simply, but it will make a lot of sense to you all. Uh, majority saying green, 20 to less than 30%. Perfect. Okay. So, before I explain how, what I'm basically going to do is explain right from scratch how a stochastic map's created, and then that should lead on to explaining why the answers you gave are not technically the correct answers. First of all, why bother with probability maps in the first place? And the reason is, is pretty obvious in the fact that probability is directly related to risk. So the higher the probability of something of an area being impacted, the greater the risk and therefore the more decisions that need to be taken. Um, consequences over here as well, and that's something that I can talk about another time in terms of how you link probability and consequence together to actually create maps of risk. That's um, somewhat of a tricky zone to enter because it's very subjective. But for the time being, we're just going to focus on the fact that probability is important. It's really important for risk and it's really important for most of the planning contingency plans that you, you have got out there. So here's the probability map that you saw earlier, a little bit scratchy. And I'm just going to walk through how that probability map got created. So effectively, right at the beginning, the modeler sets off a whole load of dif different simulations capturing um, different met ocean conditions and creates an oil spill. You then change the date and you run it again. So there's another oil spill that gets run and then another oil spill that gets run on that. So but each time we're changing the starting conditions, so start date, so we've got different met ocean conditions. So you can imagine we've had January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, one more, and one more. So I got bored after making 14 of these because I knew the amount of work that's going to come downstream. But there you've got 14 individual oil spill trajectories going all over the place. And the question is, how do we create, or how does the modeler create a probability map from that? How do we get from that splodge to what you um, saw earlier on? And the answer is something that is the grid. In all the oil spill modeling projects, 
everyone creates a habitat grid or a model domain or something like that. And you can see I've used a very coarse grid because you saw that earlier on. Again, for my sanity, making this PowerPoint presentation. But the modeler creates a grid. I haven't seen yet anyone that's specified from an operator's or a regulator's point of view what that grid should consist of, which is fair enough because it is somewhat situational dependent. But the idea here is that you create a grid simply so that you can count the number of trajectories that go through each cell. So running that through, you can see that first trajectory again, but this time what the computer is doing in the background is it's counting every time that oil slick run goes through a particular cell. Then you run the next one and you get the same effect. So over here you can see where both oil spills have gone through, you can see two. Down here, unsurprisingly, where it starts, you can see two, and everywhere else you can see one. And then it keeps building like that. So every time you run a new trajectory, it captures what happened before. And we won't go into thresholds and things like that, but you can imagine that you can get more complicated than this. But this is the basic foundation of how every probability map you've ever seen is created. They all go like this. And you can see we're at 10 now. 11, 12, 13, 14. So there you've got your sorry, there you've got your probability map, and again how that probability map came about. So everyone so far is everyone, and you can use your little voting button at the top saying you approve. I think approve is the option. If you just give a green light and just say that you're following what I'm saying so far. Green. Yeah, everyone's happy that um, everyone's following that. So that's how you create that probability map. So the question so far, I'm sure, is what you still don't, this, I still haven't explained why there's a problem with the results and why those results you gave earlier are incorrect. And the problem is the fact that we're not actually interested in the probability of those squares being impacted. The whole modeling process, because it has to, because you can't get a, because it, it makes sense, is that the, we're tracking where oil goes through one of those squares. But what we're normally interested in is our key receptors. We're normally interested in seeing when oil goes through each one of those receptors. So rather than having these randomly generated squares, the stuff that we've moved on to now is something called context-driven probability maps. And it's taking a step back from that grid in a kind of really weird way, but we have managed to do it, taking a step back. And instead of creating a grid, we focus purely on these receptors of interest. Now, had the grid given the right answers, we wouldn't need to do this. But now, because it doesn't, I can show you what happens. So now we've got the same thing, but rather than the, the grid, I'm just counting the number of times it goes through each one of the receptors. So you can see that as it goes through the fishing spawning area in the top left-hand corner up here, it's counting the, <coughs> counting the number of times it goes through that area. This one, because it doesn't go through any of our key receptors, we've decided we're not interested in it. So it does, none of the stats change. And again, that won't change the results. That will start changing. You can see the tally starting to mount up. Now, this is quite hard to do. This isn't something that you can do straight out of the existing oil spill models because you can't tie them back across. Um, and it requires things like shapefiles and things like that. But we reached the end there. And you can see that of the 14 scenarios that got released, seven entered the maritime boundary. So seven of the 14 trajectories that we released impacted the, impacted the maritime boundary. So you can see that what that leads to, and thank you for doing what I hoped you would do, is right at the beginning you said, most of you, 90% of you, said that the maritime boundary would be impacted less than 30% of the time. But what I've just shown is seven of the 14 trajectories actually impacted that area. So the actual probability is 50%. Now, there's no, I have never seen anyone calculate or present probability from that method other than what we've just started to do recently as a result of the OPEP stuff. The same, so you got that one wrong, 90% of you got that one wrong, which means my statement's valid right at the beginning, which is good. 
Um, that one was fine because only two did go down there. And again, the fishing spawning area, although it shows um, green on the map, actually more of them go through. So it's 36. So you can see there that what you've got is because probability maps are so f are created based on this artificial grid, it doesn't then extrapolate out to the areas that we're actually interested in, in terms of presenting to regulators, operators, the public, things like that. And it also underestimates, it always underestimates, or yeah, it always underestimates the actual probability of an area being impacted which in turn leads to an underestimation of the risk of an area being impacted. So you'll see that, and that applies to a whole range of different things from looking at the probability of a certain shoreline being impacted. You can't just pick off the largest value. You have to look at the shoreline in total and count the number of trajectories that hit each one. So you can see there, there's yet another feedback loop between EIAs and OSCPs and the modeling team where you kind of need to really get to grips with this huge amount of data underneath it and really understand how the data is created and how it's stored and the process behind it to make sure that you can actually work out what's actually happening and actually create statistics that when checked in the event of something horrible actually hold up to scrutiny. So that's I think draws me to the end of that bit yep so is there any questions have I have I have I kept everyone on board or have you have I completely lost you Does any questions come through while so as I'm talking um, so there was a question on how many simulations were run um, to create the map so it's just worth mentioning that the map is just a pictorial example and not an actual real life spell Yes, yeah, so, so the pit. Yeah, so that map was there's 14 in that one. Normally, we'd run anywhere from a hundred to we've gone up to a thousand, I think. But um, it's um, quite difficult. And it, in in terms of taking this forward, especially when it comes to oil spill modelers passing oil spill modeling results over to environmental consultancies, it's really important that they're aware of this fact, because environmental consultancies won't be aware of the kind of background to this, and will just be picking up these numbers here rather than calculating these numbers here uh, there's a question about if you've ever tried the NOAA trajectory analysis planner I haven't um, no it's a software for statistical trajectories um, and yeah there's just a few comments saying um, good explanations um, and then saying that this issue seems to be um, greater or lesser depending on the grid size? Yeah, well, it's not so much the grid size, although it obviously plays a fact, it's how many grid cells you can fit into your sensitive area. So you saw, in this example, it's quite small, but if your sensitive area is about the same size of a grid cell, then it's fine. If you move into an area where many tens, hundreds of grid cells fill that sensitivity, then you're more likely to get incorrect results. So, work, especially things like working out the impact on maritime, crossing maritime boundaries, that's a big area where the error is probably a lot higher than some of the smaller sensitivities and point locations, for example. We've just got someone typing at the moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, whilst I wait for that final question, I'll just move on. Guys, thank you very much for joining me. Um, it has been. A massive um, there's been a massive flux of people to talk to me so much so that I've had to set up a second one next Thursday um, because we hit our subscriber limit pretty early on and needed to um, pad it out so if, if you think other people might be interested or um, anything like that then by all means th these links should follow on also I mentioned Neba this hasn't been announced on the website yet or I don't think it's been bounced around on emails yet it's been printed by email and LinkedIn. okay okay perfect so so there's also the Neba one coming up which oil spin modeling obviously feeds into quite strongly um, what does Monica say is there any way to study the independence grid convergence in terms of the probability map? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, you can, um, happily my next slide is perfect for that timing. Um, you can by all means get in touch with me after this. 
You can grab us through Oil Spill Response. You can grab me through LinkedIn. You can grab me through my email. If you can put Beyond the Model on the subject, then that would be great. Um, I am looking to kind of expand on this and kind of build more information on um, more information on kind of the topics that I've just briefly touched upon. And I saw a question just came through there, which was asking me to expand on. Uh, why consultants aren't interpreting data this way already? Uh, the reason being is because um, I don't think people are aware of the fact that you can't calculate the impact on key sensitivities from um, from the probability map. I think a lot of people so far have just overlaid their sensitivities on top of the probability map and pulled off the biggest number and said that's the probability. So I, th I think it's a lack of n awareness. And the other reason is that it's not something that consultants can do. The only way to get access to the actual results that I showed you is if you have the actual data that the probability map came from. So it, it falls out of the consultant's ballpark and actually lands on the shoulders of the modeler who should be doing it backwards. Anything else from anyone? No. Guys, thank you very much. Um, following this, I think there's an automatic link to a feedback form. It, it's really useful if you um, provide feedback, especially a well done. This was a um, this was a great first start, and I'm looking forward to kind of chatting and bringing up more um, conversations, and also hopefully hearing from you guys in terms of what problems you, you you guys are having and whether I can feed into that in a future blog or a discussion or anything like that. So again, I want to thank you all for um, coming along, and um, have a great day. Oh, I think question just come in. Derek snuck one in right at the end. <laughs> so it's basically, do we use the Oscar model? Do we use, yeah, oil spill response for preparedness, oil spill response use the OSCAR model, yes. And sorry, do we, do we use the OSCAR model for this type of analysis? We generate the data with the OSCAR model, but none of the oil spill models can do what I just showed you. It's a more advanced post-processing step. So we pass that data out to MATLAB, if you're familiar with it, and process it in MATLAB. No problem. Shouldn't the comparison be between context-driven versus probability map, and instead of what audience answered versus context-driven? I don't know what that means. Uh, I'll I'll read it and reply to you um, offline, if that's all right. Fantastic. Okay, guys, um, have a great day wherever you are in the world. And thanks, CJ. I will.